Like, see, this is what, right, you have to, like, look at, you know, like, the holistic, you know, like, the ecosystem from a holistic perspective, right? Like, who are the users? What are the users supposed to be staring at? Do they have direct line of sight to it? Um, so, you know, similarly, I think, you know, we need to think about, uh, you know, what, like, what does the yeah, whole Ethereum, what should the whole Ethereum ecosystem feel like from a yeah, user perspective, you know, how users interact with it, what kind of experience uh, users would have, and, like, how all of the different parts actually fit together to make that happen, right? And so my view of the goal in one sentence is basically that using the greater Ethereum verse should not feel like jumping between 40 blockchains. It should feel like you're using Ethereum, right? Or to put another way, 2015-era Ethereum-like experience, 2015-era fees, with 2029-era UX quality and uh, scale, before 2029. Who's with me? Okay. So, how do we get there, right? So, uh, I mean, obviously, yeah, you know, there's like, a bunch of these uh, different pieces that need to happen, right? And, uh, you know, some of them are kind of like very yeah, technical, very mathematical, and very in the weeds. And I think some others are like surprisingly yeah, simple, right? So improve scaling first, right? So, you know, now for the last time, you know, two and a half months, uh, we have blobs, right? Uh, who here has used a blob? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> who here has like eaten a blob? <laughs> Okay, no one's eaten the blob yet, that's good. Um, okay, so, you know, basically, yeah, you know, we have these blobs, right, and because of the blobs, we have all this extra data space that rollups can use, and as a result, the uh, on-chain price of layer twos has gone down by a factor of like 100, right? Um, so, you know, we actually have cheap fees. The internet of money actually costs, um, you know, less than five cents a transaction, usually less than one cent a transaction, right? And, uh, you know, it actually feels like we, yeah, I mean, like, like we're finally, yeah, I mean, like getting out of this uh, era we were in for a really long time when you had to, like, pay $5.72 in order to do anything, and, like, the people trying to do anything actually interesting could not afford to do it for $5.72, but, like, all the uh, DGEN gamblers could, because the DGEN gamblers would even pay $57 if that helps them DGEN better. And so the DGEN gamblers define the entire narrative, right? So, you know, I think, uh, like, r lowering fees is, like, the uh, single most important thing in just enabling any kind of, uh, you know, like, competition to that whole mess. And, uh, like, we actually have that, right? And uh, I actually think that, you know, we've already gotten uh, quite a lot of uh, benefits out of that, right? So, uh, you know, if we look at, uh, you know, even take something like Farcaster, right? Like, Farcaster is uh, partially off-chain, you know, the tweets. Okay, they want you to call them casts, but, like, come on, they're tweets. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, they're, uh, you know, it's just like no matter what brand, it's a Kleenex, right? It's like no matter what brand, it's a tweet. You can write a tweet on a Kleenex. You have N brands of Kleenex, N brands of tweet, and you have N squared types of uh, tweet on a Kleenex. Uh, so, you know, you basically, uh, you know, you have... Um, like, that, that goes into a uh, not blockchain thing that offers, like, replication but not consensus on ordering called a CRDT. Um, and, uh, but then they have pieces that go on chain, particularly creating new accounts, um, you know, like, managing um, ownership of accounts, uh, usernames, and things like that. And, like, that stuff can actually be cheap, right? So... I remember um, using um, like a, uh, a social recovery wallet like about four years ago. Um, and I think I mean, like, this was uh, Argent, right? And uh, like I remember actually running through the recovery procedure and like paying the on-chain gas to do the recovery cost like $96. And I'm like, okay, I totally understand why these guys, uh, you know, like wants to just move over to layer two, right? Um, and, uh, you know, now they have, and uh, now, I mean, now being on layer two, uh, being layer two first is uh, very mainstream. Um, and, uh, you know, at this, right, so you know, basically, uh, like, we're actually uh, at the point where you can have these nice on-chain applications, and, like, they have costs that are actually affordable, right? Like doing something like Farcaster that's like a hybrid on-chain and off-chain um, architecture, from a non-crypto user point of view, it actually like, looks sane and it's something you'd want to participate in, right? Um, same thing with prediction markets, right? So, uh, you know, back in 2021, 
I wrote this like long blog post that basically talked about uh, you know my uh, adventures uh, betting that Trump will lose the election after he already lost the election, and uh, you know basically uh, I ended up uh, like having to pay over a thousand dollars in transaction fees, right? Because it was on L1, and this was using catnip, and like it was uh, you know there was just a lot of gas, right? And then if you look at poly market today, the fees are basically trivial, right? So. That was uh, basically, yeah, you know, you get these like very real benefits to like very real specific applications that come from fixing the fee situation. So this is good, right? But you know, we have to like take it ten or a hundred times further, right? Basically, yeah, you know, we need fees to I think go even lower than today. At the same time as being able to expand uh, the user base to be a uh, hundred times bigger than today. So the next step here is peer dust, right? So this is basically actually taking advantage of the uh, poly, you know, weird polynomial magic of uh, blobs and uh, like actually getting to the point where uh, you can, like, you're not relying on every single node to store the entire blob and like you're actually saying like each individual user only needs to store like a few percent of the blob, right? So you have pure DOS, so then you have full DOS, which is like an even more crazy version of that that does two-dimensional sampling. And then actually there's like other undeclared parts of the roadmap where you can go all the way to 3D, and then you can like data availability sample the entire history, um, and then you know, and so on and so forth, right? So that's one piece. Another piece, L2 data compression, right? So uh, transactions today, a naive transaction, if it look for something like an ERC20 transfer, it's around 190 bytes. If you do like pretty naive basic compression, it can go down to like 150 or 160. If you do um, signature aggregation and you do theoretically optimal stateless compression, it can go down to around 75 bytes. And then if you do stateful compression, it could go all the way down to like 23 bytes, right? So there's uh, still roughly an unclaimed 6x cost reduction from data compression on um, L2s. High performance uh, EVM implementations. So uh, you know this is the new cool thing, right? And you have uh, you know Ref and Geth uh, starting to compete on uh, stats. Um, you know you have uh, uh, increasingly you know, like high performance L2s. You know, a lot of uh, improvements here. Also, more development of uh, plasma techniques, right? So uh, last year I made a talk basically saying we should like actually resurrect plasma ideas and take them seriously again. And uh, you know, I think right now probably Intmax is like one of the, the the most prominent project that's like seriously pushing it, and like they have this hybrid plasma roll-up thing that gives you a high level of privacy with uh, only a few bytes on chain per transaction. So lots of things, you know, we can improve scaling quite a bit. So that's one. Another one is uh, improving cross layer two UX, right? So, you know, this is uh, one of those uh, issues where like I think uh, layer twos on Ethereum today, they kind of, uh, you know, or even especially one year ago, they feel like one of those uh, cities that have these like weird subway systems where like you're supposed to really care about the differences between, you know, the subway system and the train system and like those are somehow different and then you have like, you know, buses and like you have three different types of tickets and like the whole thing is just a, a complexity zoo and it doesn't make sense, right? And, uh, you know, we have to move from that to a system where like, no, like there's the transit system and like you get a transit ticket, right? And like, you know, you just like go where you, where you need to go. So the uh, screenshot at the top here, this is uh, depositing to Polymarket today, right? So basically they have an address, the address is on Polygon, and then you have to make sure you're sending it on Polygon and not Polygon ZK EVM, right? It's like, a, no, no, you deposit to JP um, you know, Morgan, not to Morgan Stanley. If you deposit to Morgan Stanley, you lose all your money, right? It's like, no, 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 they're like two different banks, believe me, right? And so, you know, you just, like, basically, yeah, you know, you either, like, figure out how to, like, navigate your way through the zoo, or, you know, you have to, like, go and, like, uh, uh, go to, like, the local hacker house and ask your 16-year-old friends to figure out how to get the money out, or potentially, yeah, you know, if you're lazy, you just never get the money out at all, right? Um, and so, and if, you, and if that's what you're doing, then basically you're permanently reducing the supply of the U.S. dollar, which in turn allows governments to uh, inflate, uh, uh, create more supply without, uh, you know, like risking inflation. And so you're basically equal, doing something equivalent to donating to the government. So, <laughs> the, yeah, basically that's what you're 
that's what depositing is like today, right? So this is what depositing to Polymarket should look like tomorrow, right? So, you know, think of the difference between these two screenshots, right? Basically, yeah, like, so this is something called ERC3770. Basically, yeah, you just put the name of the chain into the address, right? So you have polygon colon, whatever the address is. And then it just says, okay, well, here's the address, and then you copy it, and then you put it into the browser window, right? And then when you put it into the browser window, you just like put that into the receive field. And then if you have coins on the same chain, it just sends from the same chain. And if you have coins on a different chain, it should just automatically route through some kind of cross L2 network, whatever is available, you know, ERC7683 ideally. Until then, the wallet can just like centrally manage uh, whatever like more centralized bridging solutions exist. And uh, basically, uh, you know, carry out the action of ensuring that the number of coins you have in mind actually ends up appearing at that address on that chain. So that basically, uh, <clears throat> so who here wants to uh, the uh, experience of depositing on Polymarket to look like that? Who here wants uh, the screenshot on the top and possibly donate to the government? <laughs> okay, uh, so this is, uh, so basically, yeah, you know, I think the main theme here, right, is like the the UX con UI concept of an address. Like it basically represents this idea of like if you want to pay me or you delegate authority to me, then like how do you do that, right? And like a, an important piece of that just is which chain you know you want like you want to get those coins or that authority on, right? And so that should just be part of the address, and uh, you know ERC thirty seven seventy does that, right? And the end consequence of this is basically that, like, at least in this way, we're back to a cross L2 ecosystem actually feeling like Ethereum and like the way that Ethereum felt in 2015. You have addresses, you send to them. You, and someone can interact with this without even knowing what different L2s are, and it still works for them. So that's one thing we can do. Um, account abstraction, right? So account abstraction is... Uh, one of those fascinating things because uh, like it started off at least for me being about basically saying like let people like let people use smart contracts as a way of or like smart contract code as a way of verifying signatures so they can do things like multi-sig wallets and like quantum resistant uh, you know like signature algorithms but then it like somehow turned into like being about paying for transactions in USDC and like I have no idea how that happens but like it did um, so like uh, I mean the good thing is that like uh, you know, basically, yeah, we have a bunch of standards that like actually try to like satisfy all of these use cases, right? And so, um, you know, ERC four three three seven, basically, it satisfies the use case of, uh, you know, I you know, like I want my uh, coins to be in a multi sig, and at the same time, I want to send transactions without having to like also have some of my ETH in a totally separate EOA. Um, it's uh, solves for the use case of paymaster, or it uses paymasters to solve for the use case of like having USDC and wanting and being able to pay transaction fees in USDC. It solves for quantum resistance. It solves for being able to do 10 operations in one transaction. Um, and uh, you know, now we have, uh, ear, or this should be EIP. Wow, okay. Uh, so EIP 7702, uh, which uh, basically brings like some of the, uh, <coughs> or at least, the convenience related parts of account abstraction to existing EOAs, right? So basically, if you have an EOA, then like you'd be able to essentially kind of partially delegate to smart, <coughs> to smart contract code. And if you do that, then like you get smart contract level functionality. And at the same time, you're part of the 4337 ecosystem. And so hopefully, we get to grow the 4337 ecosystem at the same time. Um, another big thing here is key store rollups, right? So basically, yeah, when you change your key or like you upgrade your account, ideally you should not have to do that like n times once for every layer two. Ideally, your wallet just like lives in one place, um, <coughs> and then whenever you take actions anywhere else, uh, you uh, have to. Uh, um, does that have CO2 or no? Is it CO2 water or? I, yeah, mineral, uh, mineral water, okay, I'll try it. Mm. Okay, it's a little too co 2 for me, but thank you. Um, yeah, okay, so 
basically, uh, again, key store rollups, uh, you know, your wallet code is in one place, you get to upgrade it in one place, and so again, you know, we get a UX that feels like 2015 Ethereum, but at the same time in the context of a scaled layer two ecosystem. Building out the Guardian um, ecosystem, right? So basically, uh, so crypto wallets, right? And uh, like, I think for a long time, we've had this like very uh, annoying tension, right? Where basically there's like two ways to hold coins in the crypto ecosystem. The first way to hold coins in the crypto ecosystem is like you have your private key and you have your private key yourself. And if someone gets a computer virus onto your computer, then they can infi in infinite, immediately exfiltrate your coins and your life savings are gone. Now, maybe you know you can, uh, if you lose your computer, your life savings are gone. Maybe what you could do instead is you could have an offline computer and then you could have a piece of paper with your seed phrase backup, but then you know, if someone grabs hold of, your, uh, of uh, that piece of paper, your life savings are gone. And like if you ask you know, the Bitcoin maximalist people, they're like, oh, you know, you're supposed to like manually yeah, engrave your seed phrase onto like titanium at a temperature of 2300 degrees and then you bury it like 19 feet. Um, I, you know, they do, the, the maximum was do feet, right? Uh, you know, like 19 feet underground, and then uh, you know, like cover it with like three layers of unobtainium kryptonite alloy, and then uh, you know, like maybe it's gonna be safe, right? And it's like, is any normal person going to like actually wants to do that, or are they just gonna like stick everything on their phone and wait until their life savings are gone because they get unlucky? So. Here's the, the uh, historically the alternative to this, right? So you have your coins, you have your life savings, and then you see that there is like a platform, and the platform is run by this friendly guy called Sam. Sam is a trustworthy guy. He goes on, uh, you know, he goes on panels with uh, he goes on panels with highly reputable, um, you know, like people like Bill Clinton, and so you know he uh, obviously he's tr that makes him trustworthy squared, right? And so you put all your life savings on him, right? And uh, then. It you know, two years later, it turns out that he like, uh, you know, like basically trustworthy and uh, so hard that like that, that all your money turned into anthropic shares. So uh, that's uh, so basically you have these two alternatives, right? And so the thing that like I think we've always wanted for a long time is like, is there some kind of sane middle ground between these two? And the answer that I've been basically trying to show since 2013 is multi-sig wallets, right? Multi-sig wallets, you have multiple keys. You could have like say three keys out of which any two can be used to spend the funds, right? Uh, so one of them could be a laptop, one of them could be a phone, one of them could be controlled by your friend, um, you know, you could, or you know, potentially one, the third one could still be you know, the 12 uh, words in a seed phrase engraved on a piece of titanium 19 feet underground under some kryptonite and obtainium alloy. So you, know, you choose, right? The, I mean, you could even like wrap the phone in like kryptonite and obtainium as well, your choice. So basically, yeah, you know, give every, like the idea, right, is that if, once you have this kind of multi-factor setup, then if any one of those things breaks, you know, you're still safe, right? So <clears throat> like to me, this has always seemed intuitive, right? And like this is how I store all my money and this is, uh, you know, how the Ethereum Foundation stores its money. It's how like, lots of people store their money. And, uh, but the ch one of the biggest uh, challenges of this is um, like for someone who is not crypto native, like this is still challenging to actually start using, right? Because uh, like imagine you're not a very crypto native person and then you like start getting paid in crypto for the first time and like you have a, or you know, like someone sends you some USDC, someone gives you a digital monkey, uh, you know, like someone donates a three letter ENS name to you, whatever, and you like suddenly have something valuable and you need to figure out how to store it. Then like, okay, so, you know, there is, um, you know, like this uh, weird Vitalik guy and this Vitalik guy tells you you should use social recovery wallets and like, okay, you know, fine, you need to set up some guardians, okay, can you make your mom your guardian? Can you, you know, can you make your, um, you know, like high school friend a guardian? Um, and uh, then you realize like, wait, none of those people even like themselves even know how to use crypto. And so if you tell them to like themselves go and set up crypto wallets, then there's like a, a really like significant chance that a year later, like literally all of them will just uh, like do, like reinstall their phone, do something, screw up, and they'll just all lose their crypto wallets. And then, you know, the whole guardian thing is broken for you, right? And so basically, yeah, like there's been this kind of challenge 
like the, one of these uh, ch challenges in practice, right? And so a lot of people are more bullish on this concept of institutional guardians, uh, but then if you have institutional guardians, then the challenge, um, so basically, yeah, you know, you can have like specialized companies and people have actually tried to do this. Like I remember there was a company trying to do this all the way back in 2013, like basically saying, you could have your multi-sig and then like, if you sign up with my service, I'll be one of the members. And then like, if you need me to do something special, then like, I can automatically sign low value transactions, but then for high value transactions, you know, you might have to like go through KYC with me and like I'll make sure to make the process like really safe and really robust. But like none of these uh, companies have really worked well, right? And so the good news is that uh, since then we actually have uh, a whole bunch of different new toolkits in order to make this uh, kind of guardian ecosystem even stronger, right? So. One of the really fascinating ones is uh, ZK wrappers of existing services, right? So here's what you can do. Let's say you have an email address. What you can do is you can make a smart contract, well, or you can make a zero-knowledge proof that verifies that you sent an email using your email address, right? So this does involve trusting either Google or whatever other provider you use. Like basically they need to use uh, DKIM signatures. So if you have a signature and you have a ZK SNARK that verifies that signature, and then you generate off-chain, you know, a yeah, 4337 smart contract wallet that requires like a verification of one of those signatures in order to approve a transaction. And then you take that piece of code, you convert it into an address, and what you've done then is you've basically turned an email address into an Ethereum address that only is usable by generating a ZK SNARK using an email that you sent from your address, right? So basically you're converting an email address into a corresponding Ethereum address. You can also do the same thing for government ID, right? So there's projects like there's Anon at Har, which does this for the uh, Indian government ID. There's similar projects being worked on for Japan. There's projects uh, being like this for a lot of uh, a lot of different places. So basically, you can essentially take any Web2 identity provider, whether corporate or governmental or otherwise, and like through ZK Snarks, like basically force them to be one of your guardians, right? So if you do this, uh, then, uh, you know, we do have, like, this uh, basically gives, uh, like, actually you know, lets you have a yeah, type of guardian that is dependent on like a thing that you, if you're a non-crypto user, are already used to controlling and keeping track of, right? And so at least you don't have this problem where like, oh, you know, you're basically telling your mom to like go create, uh, you know, a new MetaMask wallet and then a year later she upgrades her phone and forgets, right? Because instead, you know, it's like you're piggybacking off of accounts that other people already have and, the, and so accounts that they actually have an incentive to keep and maintain, right? And so my vision for like how this uh, should work in the future is basically, yeah, you know, imagine, you know, like, who here has set up a, a Gnosis uh, safe wallet? Good, okay. Um, ah, but have you? Because they rebranded to safe a few years ago. <laughs> okay, so I'm trying to remember. I mean, I definitely set up a Gnosis safe wallet. I'm trying to remember if, if I've set up a safe wallet. I probably have. Uh, but. I mean, I've definitely been involuntarily added to lots of safe wallets. That happens like every week. Uh, so basically, yeah, you know, you have a, when, when you set up a safe wallet, you have to like provide a list of addresses that are like who are the guardians and then like how many of them you need to access it, right? So what I think should happen is you should have a UI where like if you want, you put in a Ethereum address. But if you want, you can also put in an email address. If you want, you could put in a government ID number. And then that just automatically gets converted into a ZK Snark verifier for that email address or whatever else in the back end, right? And then if you need to actually use it later, then like you have a, yeah, a UI by which you can actually use the email and then actually use that to send a yeah, transaction, right? And then potentially we could go even further, like if this stuff uh, gets uh, integrated, like if we actually get like Web3 social going even better, then like there is an even more natural integration, right? So like one feature that, what, one of my really nice feature that WeChat has, right? Or at least it had back when I was using it is basically yeah, like if you, uh, like, if you lose your accounts, then to get back into your account, one of the things that you need to do is like basically tell two of your contacts 
to send a uh, like a particular six digit code to uh, to you right like basically it's like social recovery that's based off of the the set of people that WeChat already knows you frequently talk to right so and so basically a lot of this like you can make a lot of this stuff much more natural if you like actually combine it with like something that's uh, aware of like what your actual what your other social connections actually are right so you could do that, but then even within the context of the safe UI, you basically have something where you can put in ETH addresses, and the ETH address and an ETH address can be on a laptop, on a phone, it can be the 12 words out on a titanium 19 feet underground. You can have email addresses, you can have institutional guardians, and like basically you're just able to mix and match whatever combination of them you want, right? So that's another piece. Um, hardening Ethereum, right? Basically, uh, making the uh, Ethereum layer one like really stronger and more durable. Um, so one is uh, snark everything. Like it should be possible to verify Ethereum blocks just by verifying one proof. Quantum resistance on everything. So uh, quantum resistance on the state tree. So uh, eventually, yeah, you know, basically, yeah, instead of Verkle, you know, we'll be running on uh, some kind of starked binary hash tree. Blobs. At some point, we have to replace. Uh, the uh, KCG blobs with uh, something um, hash-based. Uh, consensus signatures, uh, so uh, probably replace BLS aggregation with Stark aggregation. And user accounts, so once we have full account abstraction, users will be able to swap out their existing signatures, which are ECDSA-based, with signatures that are quantum resistant, you know, like such as Lamport, Winternet, Stark-based, whatever, right? Protocol simplification, more durable solutions to economic centralization issues, which includes liquid staking issues, includes MEV issues, includes all of them, and uh, recovery from 51% uh, attacks, right? Basically, if a 51% attack does happen, including like something like a censorship attack, then like have a very good and very solid way to try to have uh, an automated response to that. Um, potential L1 improvements, right? So, uh, you know, EVM improvements, so EVM max and uh, SIMD, you know, could be uh, a way to uh, support like some of this kinds of cryptography. Faster block times, the faster um, L1 block times are, the more uh, L2 applications can be on based rollups, uh, which uh, has a lot of benefits. And then, you know, obviously there's like, like I think uh, there's a way in which like sort of natively faster L1 and proposer pre-confirmations are kind of competing with each other, right? And uh, like I think uh, if you can have something that's like native and backed by Ethereum fork choice, I think it could be more robust. Though you could also stack the two if you want. Reduce the gas cost of overpriced operations. This is like my favorite way of raising the gas limit, right? There's basically a lot, like a lot of the time we push the gas costs of certain operations up, but there is gas costs that we could push down as well. Multi-dimensional gas and multi-dimensional gas could also uh, increase average capacity without increasing worst case capacity. Um, sister protocols, right? So uh, I think a big part of the Ethereum ecosystem working as uh, it should is uh, like actually having all of these, I mean, like not, blo not blockchain-y or sort of semi-blockchain-y parts that are beside it, right? So when Gavin Wood, I um, mean, you know, like introduced uh, the Web3 vision back in 2014, right, you had like the three pillars, right? You had Ethereum, Whisper, and Swarm. So Ethereum obviously exists, right? And we're all here. Um, I mean, raise your hands if you're using Cardano. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Cool. That's, uh, no, no, two, yeah. No. No. Let's uh, round of applause for the bravery. Um, <laughs> then, uh, Whisper. You know, still Whisper still exists. It's uh, you know rebranded to Waku. Still going strong. Um, if you use Railway, Railway is using Waku under the hood. Status is using Waku under the hood. A lot of things are using it. ZK attestations, so this is like the whole credentials, reputation, identity layer. Also put things like proof of personhood, other forms of anti-Sybil um, in there. So Zoopass is doing this, and uh, you know, I know there's other projects that are doing this. File storage, so we have IPFS. There's also value in like incentivized file storage. More secure DAP browsers, this is like a good one, right? Because uh, right now, when you access an average DAP, you're like accessing a website. And if that website gets hacked, the attacker can just like immediately replace the UI with like a UI that basically steals all your money, right? This is bad. Um, so 
like the thing with like Ethereum is like we have all of the infrastructure to like do a much better job of version control, right? Basically, yeah, like if you put your DAP interface on a .eth website, then like you actually need to do an on-chain transaction to update it, right? And like ideally, I think we should basically have like like get to the point where you actually have like a multi-sig or a DAO or like some kind of like very secure mechanism that has to like directly approve new UI hashes. And then as a user, you would like automatically, yeah, you know, like see what that UI hash is, right? So there's no single server that you'd be able to hack into in order to get people to see fake UIs, right? Um, ENS is, continues to be valuable. ENS is, um, you know, announcing some plans for going in L2, which is going to be great. Privacy protocols, so you know, we have Railway, we have um, Oxbow slowly starting to launch, so uh, a lot of uh, growth on, uh, like ne uh, on next generation privacy protocols, so uh, a lot of really important stuff here. Um, so like, if you think about all of these things together, right, like it really feels like you know, the uh, Ethereum vision is like actually coming together in this very holistic way, right? Like you actually have something that feels like Ethereum and like it has the benefits of 2015 era Ethereum, but at the same time it's much more efficient and it works at scale. And then at the same time you have all of these uh, off-chain sister protocols starting to actually work. One other thing that I think we were, would be amazing if we do more as an ecosystem is to like dog food our own apps and to like basically like actually try to like implement you know the entire like science fiction universe of like being Ethereum ends to end, right? So imagine if uh, you know you can step one, you buy a ticket to this event on chain and like really on chain, right? So like if you want to bypass the UI, like you can just go on Etherscan and you can click write contract, you can buy that way. Then step two, nobody anywhere runs a server. There's no server that sends you an email. There's no any server that issues a ticket. Instead, in order, to, the thing that you show at the door is just directly a QR code that contains a zero knowledge proof that proves that you own a ticket, right? So who here wants to live in that world? Amazing. Let's, let's actually build it. Um, get off Telegram, figure out crypto-native, encrypted, and decentralized messaging. Um, you know, today status is, or signal is better. Um, status is, um, you know, like increasingly doing well. We can do even better. Get dApps onto IPFS, have update keys controlled by multisigs. You know, like basically, yeah, I mean, like be the uh, Ethereum verse that you want to see, right? So that's uh, like basically yeah, you know, like where I think we are, right? Like I think uh, there's a lot of these different uh, threads of uh, infrastructure that are like really yeah, actually making um, a lot of progress. And I think one of the really yeah, important things that's valuable to have at the same time as working on these separate threads is to like, continue to think about the holistic vision, right? Like basically, yeah, you know, think about it from the point of view of, uh, a, uh, a user and you know, like they want to do something like, uh, you know, like move their coins onto um, you know, like Optimism in order to buy a, a conference ticket on Optimism um, and then um, you know, like prove that they have that ticket somewhere else and then potentially you know, like automatically get a Pope when they actually show up and then, uh, you know, like and then go from there and like basically yeah, make like that, that entire pipeline like actually feel like part of a yeah, holistic ecosystem based on the interoperable standards that everyone can be part of, right? And um, I think uh, if we yeah, like actually continue to pull together and get these things uh, done, then like, we, I, like I think we actually can um, you know, realize this, uh, the goal in one sentence, right? And basically yeah, like actually build something that uh, has the benefits of being 40 different blockchains, but at the same time feels like, feels like and is a unified Ethereum ecosystem. So, thank you. Okay. Um, we'll keep the talk with us for another 10 minutes. So, we'll have a Q&A session now. Uh, please uh, use this opportunity to ask your questions. So, we'll pick the guy in blue. Um, Mm. Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, I mean, I was definitely very uh, 
Im very impressed. I mean, I yeah. I mean, like I stayed at ETH Kiev, uh, the hackathon for basically uh, you know the whole two days. People are definitely asking uh, all kinds of uh, sophisticated questions, like things around interacting with the uh, MEV searcher ecosystem, around like integrating between I um, mean, like national ID systems and I uh, mean, um, like the the crypto ecosystem, and like what are some of the right ways to do it. Um, I mean, I only found out when I was there, right, that there was this like whole other bigger event that like literally yeah, had uh, you know, like over 2,000 people there. And that was uh, basically, yeah, like basically functioned as like a normal crypto event, right? So that was just uh, like really yeah, amazing to see. I mean, otherwise, uh, I mean, like I yeah, definitely, yeah, you know, really loved, loved Kiev as a city so far. Definitely yeah, look forward to being there more. So uh, yeah, no, great job, guys. Anyone? Okay, they in the hat. What benefit DAOs can be, sorry, to the meme coin ecosystem? <laughs> yeah, okay, I mean, so, I think, uh, okay, so here is my, uh, like, my view on, you know, like, the whole, like, meme coin, um, you know, like, topic in general, right? So, like, first of all, you know, like, I'm, like, I'm not against people having fun, right? Um, and uh, I'm actually, yeah, you know, I think people, uh, you know, like, having fun is great. Like, how can I be anti-meme coin when I personally still hold millions of doge, right? Um, so, the, uh, like, the thing that I'm against are, like, basically, yeah, you know, like, things that are low effort and, uh, I mean, like, and things that are kind of fundamentally, yeah, uninteresting and extractive, right? So, like, so here's, like, an example of, like, the thing that I'm worried about happening, right? So, who here has watched uh, Star Wars Episode Seven? Who here thinks Star Wars Episode Seven deserves to exist? <laughs> Fewer hands, right? So how do we like explain Star Wars Episode Seven from a game theory perspective, right? And it's like pretty simple, right? It's basically uh, social capital consumption, right? What you have is uh, you know you have uh, this uh, thing called Star Wars, and you have like a bunch of I mean like brilliant people that made a whole bunch of uh, ep episodes. I mean, I mean I personally even think I thought Episode One was fine, right? And uh, like basically build up all of this goodwill, right? But the problem with uh, you know, like goodwill is that it's this kind of asset, but it's like not a very yeah, you know, like liquid asset, right? It's like uh, you know you can't like uh, take goodwill and then uh, you know, like use it, use it to like buy yeah, you know, like Lamborghinis and uh, like expensive parties in Miami, right? And so what you what you want to do instead is like okay, you have this like goodwill which is an illiquid asset, and then you want to like convert it into a liquid asset which is money, right? And so what you do is like okay, you know you make a new episode and like you uh, don't like inevitably don't do a very good job on it, but then you know you still use the branding and you get money. And like it might seem like okay, you know you're burning your brand, you're losing a lot of reputation, but like the reality is that's the point. You're converting the illiquid thing into the liquid thing because like you want to have the parties in Miami, right? So. The, yeah, like basically, yeah, like I think uh, the thing that I don't want to uh, see is like basically that kind of like social capital consumption that I think, I mean, it doesn't even happen just in meme coins. It happens in a lot of places, right? It's like people who have reputations and then they feel the need to monetize them more and then they just go and create coins, right? So the thing that I want to see is <clears throat> projects that have uh, like uh, a, a, a couple of different properties, right? So first, I think uh, you know, they should try to like actually be more interesting than just like you buying a coin and like the, the coin going up, right? Second, I think uh, you know, ideally these things should like actually try to be good for the world in some way, right? Um, and uh, I think you can actually like combine those two aspects, right? You could have like, for example, a DAO that might like choose, you know, which charitable projects to fund in a particular range, and like this would be something that's like actually engaging that people really want to participate in. And three is like it needs to be sustainable, right? Like basically, yeah, like I want to see more projects where there's like a clear story for why the lease still exists ten years from now, right? And like I think actually, yeah, Dogecoin is like an existential proof that like you could literally have a meme coin that lives for a decade, right? Um, and so, uh, basic, I, basically, yeah, 
you know, like, be, one of the challenges that, like, I mean, I actually think this issue goes a bit beyond that, right? Basically, yeah, one of the challenges is, like, a lot of the mechanisms that we yeah, have in, this, in the crypto space are, like, very short-term, right? So, like, airdrops, for example, right? So, airdrops, um, you know, you uh, get people a, a lot of goodwill, and, uh, you know, you, you build this community, yeah, you know, you generate some good vibes, but then five years later, like, who here remembers that Uniswap had an airdrop? So, okay, some people. Okay, more than I thought. That's good, right? But, but like, uh, you know, the, uh, basically it's like, you know, is the value, like, even to you, the project of, like, having something like that, it's, like, much less lasting than it could be, right? And so, like, basically the problem is, like, if you do something like an airdrop, then, like, on day one, it's like, oh, amazing, we're supporting the community, yay, good vibes. Okay, I mean, sometimes you actually have, like, bad vibes because you have, like, random shills who, uh, you know, like, deserve, think they deserve to have the airdrop but didn't get it, uh, but... Uh, you know, you, but, but then the problem is that like five or ten years later, your the project just kind of regresses into, um, you know, like oh, this is just a project that's uh, controlled by you know the elites of the previous generation, and like we the new kids want to do something else, right? And what I want to see is like projects that somehow give the new kids an ability to like actually participate in existing projects, right? And so I think maybe. Airdrops should not be one time. Like, I think maybe you should have like sophisticated issuance events as something that even happens like regularly once every couple of years, right? This is uh, one of the things that I think like optimism retro funding does right, right? You're like, uh, you know, you just keep having more of these retro rounds, and this just keeps being a thing where new people can come in and uh, uh, potentially, uh, you know, like get get a share of the funds, right? So, basic, like I think. Uh, this is one of those reasons why, like, I want to have more DAOs, right? Because, uh, like, you want to have, uh, you know, like, not just, like, if you have a static currency, then, like, the entire, like, live playerness of the community is, like, entirely front-loaded on day one, right? It's, like, the only live action that you can take is launch the coin and then, uh, like, be, have a supply allocation and use the initial supply, right? What we want is we want a system where, like, the live playerness of the ecosystem, the ability of the ecosystem to, like, act, go, go go in new directions and like have new collective adventures be something that continues to exist three years, 10 years, 30 years into the future, right? So like that's the, also some of the kind of stuff that I yeah, wants to see more of. So, so basically your favorite meme coin is Dogecoin, just kidding. <laughs> well, I guess I'm also advocating that Dogecoin should like make a 2.0 version of itself that okay. uh, like, let's, I mean, obviously it's just switch to proof of stake, but then, uh, you know, like actually, yeah. oh, wait, wait, okay, I just realized like I've like literally been suggesting to them already that they do this, like basically, yeah. The thing that I suggested is like switch to proof of stake. With proof of stake, you could have lower issuance, and then they should basically have half the issuance actually be distributed via DAO to like some kind of charity projects that Dogecoin holders vote on, right? Nice. And so then like you actually have like an ongoing thing that like makes Dogecoin, you know, like an interesting ongoing story that can renew itself. Okay. Um. So we'll have um one more question from the lady in the mm. dress. Uh, I'm Denitza from Propi. Mm -hmm. Balaji was here in the morning, and I know you're kind of a follower of the network states, and you made some experiments. So I want you to tell everyone here what's your take on property rights on chain, and most specifically, real estate on chain, titles on chain. Mm. We we do that on Ethereum, by the way. Yeah. Okay. This is uh, no. This is actually pretty interesting and in like deep topic, right? Real estate on chain. I mean, I think, uh, so first of all, there, I, like, there are a lot of benefits that come from like just plain digitization, right? Like basically, yeah, you know, like once, uh, like in, in, in probably yeah, still most of the world, like, like land ownership rights are like not even digitized, right? And so you don't even have like a digital record of like, if you own a house, like what is the exact, you know, like, pulp. Right, exactly. Or so often no record at all, right? And if you don't have a record, then, uh, you know, you can't use that as collateral. Like, there's uh, a lot of value that you just, like, can't unlock as a result of that, right? So that's, uh, you know, one of, those, um, w one of those issues. Another issue is that, like, ultimately, I think that, like, the way that Western society does real estate ownership is like kind of fundamentally screwed up and like probably socially harmful in a whole bunch of ways. 
Um, and like one of the big reasons why is basically like, so first of all, you know, there's like this meme that like houses are an investment and they're supposed to go up. And then there is the other meme, which is like housing is supposed to be affordable. And these two are just obviously incompatible, right? It's like math, you know? Either the thing goes up, in which case it stops being affordable or the thing stays flat, right? And uh, realistically, nothing stays flat. Like what happens is it sometimes goes up and sometimes it goes down. And when things go down, people get five times more upset, right? And so, so this is one of the problems. The other problem is like you end up being, you know, like super leveraged on like one thing in one particular location, which is just like not actually, uh, you know, like what you want to do from an investment perspective. But basically, yeah, you know, like you have a lot of these uh, different problems all over the place. And so I think uh, if you want to like try to experiment with uh, different models for like how land ownership can be done, right? And like this is something that could be done both at you know like like a national or city level, and like you could do things like land value taxes, or you could have like a much more local thing, and you know you could have uh, stuff like shares of a con of a condominium, and like you could have uh, like more interesting arrangements for how that gets uh, uh, that gets distributed, right? And uh, you know you could even have structures where like if you own own something, you know, you own a property and then you also own like some kind of partial rights that includes some ability to vote on, you know, like what happens with some common property, then like basically, uh, you know, like digitizing is like the first step to making any of that actually possible. And then if you go from digitizing to blockchainizing, then like you actually get like much more direct ability to like pr actually, get, you know, like prove things about your current ownership to like if you want to do things like uh, on-chain governance, uh, then uh, you would be able to do that. And like basically, yeah, it just becomes much easier to like compose and like iterate and like make everything programmable and experiment with a lot of different designs, right? So I think that kind of stuff is uh, really cool. Hmm. Uh, um, do you want to take one more question? Sure, I'll take one more question. Pick one, pick one from the audience. Okay. Um, I'll take, uh, let's see, someone from the back, uh, a woman with the glasses, yes. No, 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 yes, you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, yeah, woman with the glasses, yes. Woman with the glasses. No, no, no I... Sorry, no front running. <laughs> um, thanks so much for the talk also about uh, um, mm -hmm. all the different uh, guardian solutions that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I work with Signum Bank in Switzerland, mm -hmm. and actually we're a fully licensed bank that's working on an institutional solution for recovery. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we're kind of addressing or dealing with is the need for KYC in this process. So mm -hmm. I know you've talked about ZK, but mm -hmm. when you're talking about institutions, I think it's yeah. a bit of a journey to get to where there is uh, yeah. acceptance of ZK um, yeah. identities and um, mm. and there's also the crypto crowd that doesn't really like KYC. So <laughs> what's the middle ground there or what's yeah. the solution? Okay, so in the, yeah, in the solution that you're building, like are you basically being like the, like are you, do you have the power to like, are, like are you the sole guardian? Like do you unilaterally have the ability to recover or are you just one of N? Right, okay, but I mean like yourselves as the bank, right? Like, uh, like does the bank only have like one of N authority or does the, okay. Okay, so, I mean, that's uh, interesting. I mean, it does surprise me that there's KYC issues because like when I looked at like that, regu that side of uh, the regulatory uh, issue, then uh, at least my understanding then was that like, if you have unilateral authority, like if you have enough keys that you can actually like grab the money or stop the money yourself, then like that counts as control and you have to do all this KYC stuff. But if you're like, if you're less than that, then uh, you be, then you don't because like you're not actually, you know, like a money controller and that makes you not a transmitter. But I mean, it's possible that like, uh, I mean, it's possible the regulation has gotten stricter since then. Like I feel like, even if it has, like, I feel like that's something that really should be challenged, right? And the reason why I think it should be challenged is basically that, like, all of this stuff that we're talking about, like, <coughs> it's not just financial infrastructure, right? Okay, fine, I'll have it despite the CO2. <laughs> um, yeah, so, basically, yeah, like, this isn't just financial infrastructure, right? This is, like, a user having ownership of an account. It's like general purpose infrastructure like a phone number, right? Which is like usable to, like you can stick financial stuff on top of it, you could also stick like totally not financial stuff on top of it, like how 
like one of the things that my Ethereum multisig does is uh, it's the recovery key uh, uh, key to my yeah, Farcaster account, right? And so I feel like I would not underrate like actually yeah, like trying to push and like make the legal case that uh, you know if you're not unilaterally controlling or or like having the ability to stop funds, uh, like you should you should not actually need to KYC. Um, but uh, I mean if that stuff has uh, already been tried and failed, then uh, you know, like obviously, yeah, that does uh, make uh, you know, like doing institutional guardians out of Switzerland harder, which is um, unfortunate. But uh, I mean, it definitely, yeah, you know, wish people in and outside of uh, Switzerland all of the best in trying to make this and make this work out well in a way that's uh, like st stable for people. Hmm. Okay. Um Hmm. In the time concern, I think we'll, uh, I'll throw you hmm. one last question. Hmm. Uh, when is the next Zuzalu? Well, I mean, so the, what, what we're doing with Zuzalu this year, right, is like basically decentralizing the concept. And so there is uh, a bunch of independent groups that are creating their own uh, zoo villages this year, right? Can so you fill the audience in what is Zuzalu, by the way? <laughs> How about you do it? <laughs> I, um, I want to hear. My my version is Zuzalu is the best um, college camp. Okay. <laughs> like, we're a bunch of kids mm. who are curious and uh, who mm. have um, rebellious bone in us, and we mm. want to change the world. So we get together mm -hmm. and we kind of form this little village. Everyone is brothers and sisters, and mm. we live, eat, and learn together for a good two or three months time. And you get to play chess with Vitalik and have hot pot <laughs> with Vitalik, go, go hiking with Vitalik. Mm -hmm. um, but, sure. but I think the main, the main value of Zuzalu is not Vitalik, not just Vitalik, <laughs> but, but the experience itself. Uh, yeah, okay, so, uh, okay, yeah, so uh, basically, yeah, you know, in order to uh, in order to verify the viability of the concept without Vitalik, which is uh, an important property for any social institution to have, because I don't want to like uh, hop around on a plane day to day, like somehow uh, you know like propping up uh, you know, like villages or whatever, right? Then I, I like basically yeah. The, like the, what we've decided to do this year, right, is we basically decided to say anyone has the uh, ability to like spin up their village, and um, you know there's even a quadratic funding round uh, by which um, you know like people can uh, try to get uh, uh, some uh, uh, some grants to help set up. Uh, but otherwise, like, so what we've already seen is like we've seen spinoffs that have these like different directions and culture focuses, right? So there was Vitalia, which was in uh, Prospera in, Fun in Honduras, that like really focused hard on the uh, longevity uh, angle. Then uh, we have uh, we, there was uh, Zoo Zanzibar, which was in uh, you know Zanzibar um, off the. Off the uh, east coast of Africa, and like basically trying to create connections between, you know, people who come and uh, the local communities that really wants to turn Zanzibar into a much more tech-forward place. There was Zoo Berlin, which basically, yeah, I think, uh, ended up being in, uh, a really fascinating Ethereum intellectual salon. Uh, there's going to be one in Georgia soon. Uh, there's going to be yeah, a couple in uh, Chiang Mai later in the year. What well, I think, uh, I think one elsewhere in Thailand, uh, one in Taiwan. Uh, so uh, it's uh, in Madeira. Yes. Oh, also um, not quite Brazil, but one in uh, Argentina in August. Uh, so uh, it's uh, and but uh, you know if you want one in Brazil, you can make one. Um, <laughs> Yeah. How, how many people in the audience have been in Zuzalu? Can you show your hands? Oh, uh, that's just... awesome. Please share with all the yeah. people in the audience your experience later. Yeah, no, it's, uh, but no, no, it's, uh, you know, what, it's, it's happening and we'll keep having more of them. So, thank okay. you. Okay, we're so honored to have Vitalik mm -hmm. today. Let's give him a round of applause.